Thank you for joining us at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston for today's online worship service. We are longtime members, Earl and Georgette Dredge. Dr. Vossen is away this week. Reverend D. Scott Cooper, Assistant Minister of Congregational Life, is preaching this morning. He is joined by Alex Kamig, Family Minister Coordinator, Carol Burris, Director of Religious Community, and Tawana Grice, our Business Administrator. Mark Vogel, our music director, is assisted this morning, this week, by pianist James Westfall. In today's sermon, Reverend Scott shares thoughts about the issues that keep resurfacing time and time again in our country, and why now may be the time we actually are able to make progress. Some of you may be new to our congregation or online services. So let us say a few words about Unitarian Universalism. We are a faith community that believes we do not need to think alike to love alike, and that how we live our lives is ultimately more important than what we profess to believe. We are a faith community that recognizes the importance of fellowship and cooperation and advocates for an individual search for truth and meaning. We encourage and support spiritual growth within each of us. Our Judeo-Christian roots have taught us the worth of each individual and the importance of justice and compassion. We respect other faith traditions because God is experienced in many ways. We appreciate the diversity of peoples because love is experienced in many ways. We honor the environment and all her creatures because our existence and experiences are inescapably interconnected and interwoven. We are a faith community that welcomes you to our worship service this morning. We hope that you find this time together a source of comfort and clarity. Thank you for joining us. We now invite you to hear our call to worship. Welcome. Another week has passed way too quickly and far too slowly. We gather together this Sunday morning once again. Welcome, you who join us virtually and spiritually while we are physically apart. Another week has passed way too quickly and far too slowly. We do not gather together until we return to normal. We gather together instead having worked this week in anticipation of the time we can congregate in a better, more just, healthier world. In this hour, we reach out to others watching and join hearts, if not hands, and raise our voices in song one with another. Welcome, you who long for connection. Come, let us worship together. Celebremos compartiendo nuestras vidas, encendiendo esta luz. Thank you. 
Please join with me in the spirit that some call meditation and others name prayer. Make yourself comfortable. Relax. Take one deep breath and then another. Open your mind. Open your heart. Spirit of life and love, God of many names and mystery beyond all our naming. Today, we name you the God of persistence lending us strength as the hot summer days of masks and isolation continue relentlessly. Today, we name you the God of healing, the God who comforts the grieving, and the God who bestows patience when needed and impassions us with impatience when required. We ask for persistence. We ask for wisdom. We name you as the God who comforts and strengthens the families of all those hurt and killed by violence, and all those who have fallen ill or have died because of the pandemic. We pray for wisdom for our leaders and pray they come to realize that their decisions are not primarily political or economic, but ethical and medical Literally, our lives and the lives of our friends and family are affected by what direction they choose to take us. We pray in the names of all those known and unknown, present and absent, remembered and forgotten. We pray in the names of all helpers of humankind. May the congregation, absent in body, though present in spirit, say amen. We pause now together to lift up that which sits heavy and light on our hearts. We lift up Tara, the daughter of the Venerusos, as she will undergo surgery on Friday, as well as Tara's daughter, Arya Rose, who is, of course, worried about her mom. I invite you now to say the name or bring to mind those you wish to be held by the loving embrace of this religious community. They are part of the great cloud of witness and memory, and we will, even if we do not know their names, hold them in our hearts. In this great cloud of witness and memory, amid this beloved community, We hear these names and hold them in our hearts. Let us remember the suffering and joy amid and among our community that we do not know. We pause in awe and wonder of the mystery that is life. In the spirit of love, in the spirit of hope, and in the spirit of compassion, I invite each of you to enter into a time of silent prayer, meditation, or reflection. See you. 
offering this morning will again go to sustain local organizations that are working to address police brutality and build power in Houston's black community. The shared offering will be split between the Texas Organizing Project, an organization that has been coordinating bail funds for Texas protesters, the Shape Center, one of Houston's longest standing community centers, and Seha Youth and Fitness Center, which provides health and fitness programs. This is a crucial time for movements for justice. This is the fourth and final week of our shared offering for this group of organizations, so we ask that you consider making a generous donation. An offering will now be gratefully received. This reading this morning comes from Sources of Our Faith, Inspirational Readings, in a chapter called The Second Source by Kathleen Rowlands. In a religion of deeds, not creeds, we look to the example of our spiritual ancestors and the prophets of our time for the strength and the wisdom to do the right thing. Most religious traditions have their founders, their prophets, and their sages, and Unitarian Universalism is no different. We revere people like Francis David, the first clergy person in the Reformation to proclaim religious tolerance. He said, we need not think alike to love alike. We hold up Theodore Parker, the radical abolitionist minister. Susan B. Anthony, who fought for women's suffrage. Ralph Waldo Emerson, a leader of the Transcendentalist movement. Norbert Fabian Chapik, who defied the Nazis. James Reeb, martyred in Selma, Alabama, in the cause for civil rights, and many more. Yet we do not lift up our own luminaries above all others, saying that only with them will truth be found. We are led to deeper wisdom and action by many outside our own faith story who have spoken to the human condition and to the ethical demand to leave the world better than we found it. Those who we call prophets include courageous leaders of direct social action, but also those who call for an inner revolution that must precede any transformation in the wider world. Many theologians have reflected on the inseparability of justice, compassion, and love in our engagement with the world. Justice without compassion can lead to legalism, and brutality. Loving without a commitment to justice can be mere sentimentality. The powers and structures of evil surround us. Many religious doctrines try to define and explain them, but we have turned away from theological disputes about evil, focusing instead on faithful encouragement to stand up and confront it. Prophets by Clinton Lee Scott. Always, it is easier to pay homage to prophets than to heed the direction of their vision. It is easier blindly to venerate the saints than to learn the human quality of their sainthood. It is easier to glorify the heroes of the race than to give weight to their examples. To worship the wise is much easier than to profit by their wisdom. Great leaders are honored, not by adulation, but by sharing their insights and values. Grandchildren of those who stone the prophet sometimes gather up the stones to build the prophet's monument. Always, it is easier to pay homage to prophets than to heed the direction of their vision.
I've noticed a lot of people have been unusually interested in history in the last week or so, especially the history of the early years of the United States. <laughs> Who knew? Apparently, it was prompted by the streaming of the Tony and Pulitzer Prize award-winning Broadway musical, Hamilton. Hamilton has been described as being about America then as told by America now. I've been talking to people who have loved learning about the Founding Fathers, their personal lives, and how, despite the passage of nearly 250 years, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The character of King James III even reminded some folks of a current world leader. I'm trying to remember who exactly they said. In the book of Ecclesiastes, part of the canonical wisdom literature of the Hebrew Bible, we read, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Despite the fact that these musings were once written on scrolls and I scrolled down the BibleGateway.com webpage to read them, the fact that papyrus and pixels are so vastly different would lead us to believe that there are indeed new things under the sun. So I began thinking about comparisons between what is happening now and what has happened in the past. People have been comparing COVID-19 to the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. We recently saw a decline in the GDP and rise in unemployment that reminds some of the Great Depression, followed by Saharan dust imitating the Dust Bowl. Protests about the Confederate flag and statues harken back to the war between the states and Jim Crow. And then, the world is seeing protests that are compared to those during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. All this reminded me about a metaphor for how time passes that I preached about a couple of years ago. Things are so unusual and difficult right now, I, I began wondering how my thoughts about different metaphors for time would hold up using this new information. So let, let me explain. My first semester of seminary, I took a Hebrew Bible class. I had trouble keeping straight the chronological order of events we discussed. It didn't help that I always had to stop and remember that the bigger number years happened prior to the lower number years. 1900 BCE happened before 1700 BCE. I'm very visual and ask the professor for a timeline. Well, he was hesitant to do so. He explained that ancient civilization's metaphor of time was more cyclical, not linear as ours is. Ancient peoples were astonishingly observant and precise at recording the cycles of the seasons and the stars and planets. I imagine it's because they weren't looking down at their smartphones. Things that happened this time last month or this time last year in the sky or with the weather could often be observed happening again. So he explained, looking at a cyclical metaphor with a linear mindset makes it easy to misinterpret the writings and intentions. For instance, mistaken, mistakenly extrapolating from the writings that the earth is 6,000 years old. But the Hebrew people didn't think of time as strictly a cycle. They did have the book of Genesis describing a beginning. And later, Christians added to these creation myths a second coming of Jesus to mark the end of time here on earth. Hence the linear concept, a linear metaphor of time that we're more used to these days. Now, Mathematicians among you will know that while two points determine a line, there are lots more points along that line. And many people have believed that later points on the timeline would be more just and more righteous than the original point. That while the arc of the moral universe is long, it does indeed bend toward justice. Well, religious liberals more than 100 years ago believed that humanity was going to just keep on getting better and better, 
more moral, more generous, more just. But then the world wars were undeniable evidence that people could be as cruel, hateful, and yes, evil as ever. We, we hadn't progressed as far as we'd imagined or hoped. By the end of the wars, only the most optimistic and prophetic seemed to believe that the timeline and moral arc were indeed bending toward justice. Perhaps if we could go back in time and prevent those wars. I remember when I was a kid, a TV show called The Time Tunnel. Now, I don't remember all that much about it, except it came on after either Batman or the Green Hornet, and of course, people were able to go back in time. So what would you do if you could go back in time? Would you invest in Apple and Microsoft as they were just getting started, or perhaps maybe tell Lincoln to avoid live theater? In the past several years, and especially the past few months, I've seen various iterations of the claim on social media. If you've ever wondered what you'd have done in 1930s Germany or during the Civil Rights Movement, you're doing it. If we were able to go back in time, we could, as the popular current phrase goes, stand on the right side of history. We could march against the redcoats, march, against, march with the suffragettes, or march at Selma. We wouldn't have to wonder and trust our gut if we were doing the right thing. We would already know who had been proven moral. As we had learned in the last re as we learned in the first reading, in a religion of deeds, not creeds, we look up to the example of our spiritual ancestors and the prophets of our time for the strength and wisdom to do the right thing. But sometimes we assume more people than people were on the right side of history than actually were. Always it's easier to pay homage to prophets than to heed the direction of their vision. Those prophets weren't able to go back in time down the time tunnel, knowing how things would turn out. They stepped out knowing in their gut what was right, despite the consequences. Grandchildren of those who stone the prophets sometimes gather up the stones to build the prophet's monument. In 1968, the focus of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was on poverty, which led to organizing the Poor People's Campaign. Dr. William Barber has taken up that cause again today, but many are shocked to learn that during the 1960s civil rights struggles, only 13% of even black churches supported Dr. King. Many churches feared or were otherwise intimidated from showing support of his movement. So, as I continued to think about this whole circular, linear, time tunnel thing for a while, an idea occurred to me. It seemed logical to use a metaphor that acknowledges that we seem to repeat patterns in history, but that things aren't entirely circular. While we do repeat patterns and find ourselves responding to the same problems, they're not the exact same experiences. It's not Groundhog Day. COVID-19 isn't exactly the Spanish flu. Saharan dust sweeping across the Gulf isn't the Dust Bowl, and today's protests aren't identical to the civil rights movement. But of course, similarities exist. Well, let me give you an example. Peasants in biblical times found themselves combating something referred to as debt bondage. Paying less than a living wage is not a new innovation. Their frequent pressing need for credit made them constantly dependent on creditors. Peasants found it impossible to get out of debt with the upper class, and the story has continued down through history. In the early part of this country's history, employer, employees, little more than slaves to mining and railroad companies, were in perpetual debt to the company store 
who charged the laborers far more than they made. Now today, payday loan stores are prevalent in strip malls and low-income neighborhoods and charge exorbitant interest to those who can least afford it. Those who may work hard but not receive a living wage. Powerful people still take advantage of the oppressed. But as well as similar things repeating, we are, in some sense, traveling from one end of a timeline to the other. And I do believe that as slow as it may seem, we are getting better. That arc is bending toward justice. We are moving upward as well as forward. Now, I put all this together and came up with a new metaphor. It's a slinky. It does have a beginning and an ending, but things keep revolving back around to a similar place. And if we stretch this out, imagine how long this could be. The arc is long, as, and it is bending toward justice. Sometimes the levels seem close together, and we're not making a lot of progress, but sometimes they're farther apart, and we seem to really be making headway. But the really cool thing is, as we swing back around to similar experiences, we can look down at the previous levels and learn from earlier examples. That's why it's a spiral and not a circle. We can heed the words from prophets down through history. Here we are rounding the bend, looking upon prophets and founders and sages of yesteryear to gather wisdom and strength. As Kathleen Rollins told us in the first reading, those whom we call prophets include courageous leaders of direct social action, but also those who call for an inner revolution that must precede any transformation in the wider world. Many theologians have reflected on the inseparability of justice, compassion, and love in our engagement with the world. Justice without compassion can lead to legalism and brutality. Loving without a commitment to justice can become mere sentimentality. But a new realization hit me since I first wrote about the slinky metaphor. It occurred to me there might be a reason our timeline keeps being drawn into a spiral instead of being one long straight arc. Why do some issues persist in reoccurring on our timeline or time spir spiral? Why do these issues refuse to dissipate into history like so many other problems down through time? Colin's sermon last week led me to realize there was something about the spiral metaphor that I hadn't taken into account. I hope you watched the sermon. It includes commentary on and performances of several hymns and anthems, including John Brown's Body and the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Dr. Boston told us, history has shown again and again that there will be but endless conflict until all the contradictions of these songs are alleviated. If we want to live in a truly democratic society where political differences are resolved through the liberal value of dialogue, then these conflicts will have to be overcome. It is only then that the country might stop endlessly reliving the same history, the same conflict, that John Brown's body might finally be left to molder in the grave. We are drawn back into that spiral when we don't effectively deal with issues that must be resolved so we can move forward. As we round that turn in the slinky, we can choose to learn from the past and confront issues, or we can choose to ignore them and see them again later. Ask a therapist what happens when someone goes through trauma and doesn't effectively deal with that trauma, ignores or buries those feelings. 
At some point, those feelings will bubble up, resurface, demand to be dealt with. Some people are startled to find those feelings related to a trauma resurface after years. Apparently, something similar is happening for our country. The traumas of racism, exploiting the labor force, classism, and the myriad problems stemming from for-profit health care may duck slightly under the surface for a while. But because we have never dealt with them adequately, they continue to reappear, demanding to be acknowledged. Is our society finally ready to deal with these issues? Some seem to think so, and many hope so. It would be difficult to definitively say why now is the time, but I suspect it's a perfect storm of sorts, a confluence of events. According to a June article in the New York Times entitled, Other, Other Protests Flare and Fade, Why This Movement Already Seems Different, Activists and scholars who have studied the crest and fall of other upwellings over police killings, school shootings, women's rights, and immigration, de immigration detentions say that the widespread outrage over economic and racial injustices may give the new movement a greater durability. Protesters now say that aggressive responses by the police are only reinforcing their commitment to return to the streets. And many say the economic devastation of the coronavirus had already cleared their schedules. With jobs lost and colleges shuttered, they have nothing but time. On a late show with Stephen Colbert, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Wesley Lowry explained why he believes this is a, a breaking point I think two concurrent things have been happening over these last few years. Because we have all been watching these videos over and over and over again. For black Americans, it's been extremely exhausting. These were experiences that they always knew happened and no one would believe them. They were kind of gaslit about it. No, the cops would never treat you that way. What are you talking about? And suddenly, they're having to watch video footage over and over. But for white Americans, the video footage allowed them to see something they would never see before. The reality is the way I might be treated by a police officer could be different than the way you are, you are based on the color of our skin. So suddenly... White Americans who had no reason necessarily to know these interactions were happening or would have had to believe the black people who say that are now watching on the phone all the time. So as black Americans got increasingly more fed up, white Americans got increasingly woke. Folks, no matter their political inclination, are opening up Twitter or looking at the news or opening up their phones and watching the videos themselves. And they're saying, that guy doesn't need to be dead. Why did they kill that person? And so suddenly, it forced people to see something they might never see otherwise. End quote. So, it's a perfect storm and a perfect time for real change. A change that combines justice, compassion, and love in our engagement in the world. But what else makes today different? The most important element. This is the first time in history you are here with your level of life experience, caring, and wisdom. This is the first time in history you are here in this community with this specific set of people with their level of caring, wisdom, and intelligence. We are uniquely poised to tackle this set of problems. In 1776, a unique group of individuals were poised to change history in North America. 
when Lin-Manuel Miranda won the Best Original Score Tony for Hamilton. He shared a sonnet he had written as his acceptance speech. This is part of it. When senseless acts of tragedy remind us that nothing here is promised, not one day, this show is proof that history remembers. We live through times when hate and fear seem stronger. We rise and fall and light from dying embers. Remembrances that hope and love live longer. And love is love, is love, is love, is love, is love, is love cannot be killed or swept aside. Now is the time for us to engage love and justice and love and compassion and love and love and to be the ones that people in the future will look back upon as the prophets who did the right thing, stood on the right side of history, and left the world far better than we found it. Amen.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. It is the time to embrace our roles as the modern prophets who stood on the right side of history and left the world better than we found it. Until we are together again, go in joy, go in peace, and engage love and justice, and love and compassion, and love and love and love and love. May you go forth in peace. While our church as buildings is closed, our church as people is still meeting, but now online. There are weekly and monthly offerings to keep you connected and engaged with our community. Please join Carol Burris this morning for reflection and sharing via Zoom at 1130. On Thursday, Rev. Scott hosts the first meeting of his book discussion group. Join him at 7 o'clock to discuss A House for Hope, The Promise of Progressive Religion for the 21st Century. This book is especially great for those new to Unitarian Universalism. Please go to our website, firstuu.org forward slash online hyphen group hyphen meetings for more details. And remember, all times shown are central daylight time.